other question is asked. Go to First Corinthians chapter 15, you'll find this. O grave, where is your victory? First question. O death, where is your sting? Hey, you go backwards there. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? What caused death to begin with? Well, apart from the biblical record, you go into scientific technology, trying to figure out ways as why do we die? Why is there this uh, thing in our DNA makeup with this element of death that we're pro programmed to, uh, at a certain period, begin to die? They can't explain it. They're trying to uh, bring longevity to life. She's just trying to follow, find this area of our DNA that produces death to eliminate it and to activate longevity of life so they'll live forever. That's what they want. Men's trying to do what God did. It's already done. He's done. And the answer is hidden in the wisdom and knowledge of God in Christ, in you, and there's treasures in the earth vessel, all the religious language to explain this, but there's a seed in you. They've come close to the thick and they found that they call it the God gene. Now that's God's answer, possibly in this God gene, which they haven't even begun to fathom and understand. They don't know why, trying to get a victory over the grave, trying to find this thing of the sting of death. I mean, all this religious terminology, let me put it in the modern day language, they're trying to find the family of youth. They want to get away with what God had done and hope now. He introduced death in hope. He subjected the world to futility in hope. Now, he didn't leave you here hopeless. He also hoped beyond this world. Now, if you don't turn to this hope, that's unseen to the outside, but now we feel like we've become more like God. We can see this hope. We call it God gene. Or we can see it's in our DNA messed up. If we can get there and manipulate the, uh, to eugenics, manipulate with this element of our gene that's in every one of us that makes us all die, you know, the outward man is decaying, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day, being made fit for new existence, beyond the grave, beyond the sting of death. Well, you have to f realize, what brought about the sting of death? We know through the fall of Adam, to one man came death. We know that. Let me pause here and add a few more thoughts. But the answer is given in the context of this very text. The sting of death is sin. So it answers the question, oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is S-I-N, sin. Sin. And then he goes on to say that the strength of sin is the law. One feeds the other. Sin brings death. And to expose sin, you need the element of the law. Now, the sin is the sin nature. Understand that? It's the sin nature. Sin nature. If you don't come to see the sin nature, that's what science is failing to say. They won't admit that. That there's an inherent built in us, every one of us. Well, they, they call it uh, a flaw in your DNA. That if they could crack this flaw, you know. There's another text that kind of brings out this element. Let me see if I can share that here. You know, human efforts. Is not a rem. I guess that's what, right? Your effort is not a remedy against your effort is not as remedy against the sin nature. The sin nature is there. God put it there. And your members can't undo what was done. 
to the fall of Adam. They call it the curse. Now, they don't like using them words. One of the moth eating words has just been so distorted and people just don't want to hear them more. Okay. God took the DNA. From that point, man began to die. Self induced. We asked for it. He cuts it off from God. It produces this living independent from God. And what God had originally intended, that we'd be in a world without end, he has to end it. If not, you'll be caught in a world without God and without hope. Now we hear that expressed in the scriptures. In a world without God and without hope. Our idea of hope would be trapped into a world created by the devil himself, or man of his own mind and thoughts, cut off from God, you end up with a, I feel so I expressed it one time, now, you know, you, it's like a car, you put a battery in the car, there's a lot of power in that battery, Adam was created with full power, he came with full use of his facility, intellect, emotions, his body senses were all in, in full function. And he could build upon that. But like a battery in a car. If you had this battery in the car, you could start that, go out there and start that car up and it would run. It would ignite the engine and it would start burning the fuel and you could ride down the road. And it would get you from point A to point B. Get out of there, go to the store, Come back out, start the car again. It would start, you would have enough juice to start the car again. Get your, Now, you might be able to do that. I don't know. I never tried it to find out, but I know it would last for days, maybe, hours, depending on how many times you use that car and when you drove. Now, if you drove that car at nighttime, understand when you turn on the lights and the radio on this car, off just, you only the battery now. Just the battery. You'd run it down quick. You get the point to a point. Well, you go, go go out, go in the store, come back out, you try to start, and it wouldn't start. The battery would be dead. Why? Because it weren't for this thing called a generator in the car. There's a generator in the car. That keeps that battery constantly charged by the rotating of the engine, the motor, and constantly charging that battery. You would use up some power to start it, and when you start riding down the road with an engine running, and the generator run, it replaces that energy into that battery. Sustains it for as long as it needs to be run. Yeah. It runs years. Years before you have to replace it, get a whole new battery. You no, know, that's when the illustration breaks down. And what God had done, it would have never broke down. He would have had constant endless supply. And this power would have grew from one degree of growth to another degree of growth from faith to faith, constantly growing. Now, when we read scripture, though, though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed, being made for, fit for the new existence. We should bring that out, being made for, fit for the new existence. In your spirit, you know, we say we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. No, you, you're working out. And bring you into experience in this temporal carnal body and its limitation, the great power that's already stored within the human sp spirit to which he lived every man came in this world. In that spirit is the full play room of God. And you now you wouldn't want that to come out all at once. <laughs> you get it from one degree to another degree. That's why it's measured out in degrees. What Paul says in the book of Romans, I believe it's chapter 14, is measured out in degrees. Now, it's not that you have a little faith. Now, you have to use, I can't use that word. See, that word faith is all come, I lose people in their thinking. Okay, ain't that you got a little power in you? You had the full play room of power of God as much as the Adam who fell had when he first came to this world. And all the wisdom and knowledge of God is hidden in this treasure chest that is in this earth and vessel. And if you would use what little you got, that which generates the power would restore the power that you use and give you more and would grow from faith 
to faith to faith. You'll get to the point one day. It'll be like Enoch. He did that. He walked in his power. So I almost use that word faith. So you can't use that word. People just lose their thinking. Forget the word faith from that. Enoch did it. He walked with God to the point he was not, it says. Now, we that's a biblical text. And again, we don't know what it means by not or our limited idea where the whole thing just dis disappears. He was not. He had gained such a close contact with him. He had come to understand something greater than we've ever understood or could understand. And he had, I guess I'm saying like his cup was overflowing, his battery was fully charged to a greater capacity that he was able to, to walk out of this experience, transverse time, even see it, preached about it. Before the biblical flood. He didn't talk about the biblical flood. His preaching was about the end times. He could see it. He walked from that experience. To the experience where he re reappears. In the future. As one of the two witnesses. In the book of Revelation. Preaches for three and a half years. And dies. He's put to death by the Antichrist. And then he's resurrected in life. That has to happen because Paul has said, ever since Adam, all have died. But you would question, well, if that's true, Paul, you're mistaken because Enoch and Elijah never died. How did they escape that? They don't. They die in the future. So their future death is included in Paul's statement because Paul speaks of the eternal now. He's speaking from the viewpoint of now. He's seeing things from a heavenly place in Christ Jesus outside the framework of times, uh, past, present, or future. He sees it all one shot. So he can honestly say, ever since Adam, everybody has died. So they all died. But there are only ones that don't die. He shows it as a mystery because it's, this came from the eternal realm of now. He saw a mystery group. Who wouldn't die. But would be alive. At the appearing of Christ. Who comes down. From the eternal now. And embraces. The dead in Christ from the past. The dead in Christ from the future. And those who are yet living. At that moment. Which is an expression of the eternal now. And resurrected. The dead in Christ rise first. And we who are yet living rise with them. It's not some later event, you know. Like I say, when my dad died over 25 years ago. He's just in front of me. He's not up there waiting for his son to catch up. He's up there as cast of a ghost waiting for his body to raise up out of the grave. I would hate to see what a body looks like in that coffin 20, 25 years ago. Now, if he was buried at sea, there would be no body left. What gets resurrected? He lit every man to come in the world. That seed swallows up the corruption, corruptible body, and the incorruption becomes the resurrected, what they call Zoe body. The bios body is swallowed up, it says, in the context of this whole scripture here, chapter 15 of First uh, Corinthians. Whole new body. Now, I was, now, this is another thing I, I, I brought out in other videos, and I'll probably only touch on here, and maybe someday come out a full-length video on this very fact. You, I understand there's two resurrections. There's a resurrection of those who are blessed and go in the direction that God intended that this, uh, you know, that will man decay, and yet the new man be renewed day by day, be made fit for new existence. If you've got a body that's being made fit to live forever in the eternal realm, not like this body, the virus body, that has a beginning, has an end, and is decaying. You will have your eternal body swallow up the corruptible body, and your living soul, your intellect, and your emotions and feelings, that's the renewing of this mind, will be in this resurrected body, that will be in tune and made fit for a spiritual existence, Beyond time, space, and material world, now limited views of perspective. Yeah. Now, 
there is a second resurrection. Second resurrection. Let me make sure the thing didn't stop. It kind of stopped here. No, it didn't stop. There's a second resurrection. Now, the word resurrection wouldn't be wouldn't be used if it didn't entail a body. And it says in, in the book of Revelation that the, the, the dead in Christ, we know, rise first, and we who yet live and rise with them. That's the first resurrection. Blessed are those who partake of the first resurrection. Now, for those of the second resurrection, like I said, it wouldn't be a resurrection if they didn't entail a body. They get a body. But they've never allowed God to renew the soul of intellect and emotions. They never surrendered their will to their, to their higher mind, which is Christ in you, and all the wisdom knowledge God in you. We would have worked that out, and the old mind would have uh, surrendered moment by moment by moment to one degree to another degree. Away. The outward man would have decayed more and more, not only physical, but also mental and emotion would die, and new emotions, new thoughts would come into play. Now, to the degree that you allow that, now, he'll sustain your life in this life. And if enough got done, you probably could live past what they call the cutoff age of 121, 123. That's only the recorded history. We can realize that people live. Of course, they throw out the Bible that people live to be 930 years like Adam did or Methuselah 969 years they throw that out and try to say well I wasn't talking about time as we know time no they lived that long they had long of life something happened and beyond the flood you see it slowly diminish less and less and less and less till you get to David he lived three score and ten seventy years that's about the average lifespan this day and age we could call that being old. Hey, old. To Adam's eyes, you'd be still a baby. Noah was like 300 years old when he built the, built the ark. And his sons were 100. Oh, God. The, he always got these videos with him as an old man. He wasn't an old man. He was young. And his sons were young. With longevity life. Think of it. I thought about this the other day. I'm like, have my teeth poured out and got new false teeth here. I'm thinking, well, my God. He, now, it said during that the days of uh, Adam, they ate fruits and nuts. You ever try to bite an apple without with your teeth? Unless you got to fix the dent so you don't pull your teeth out. Or eat nuts with, with just your gums? You can't. So I'm saying... God, I got my. I had to get my teeth within the last. I um, mean, was like six years old. I finally had to get what teeth were left removed, and I got this upper plate. I'm saying, my God, he must have the gummit. Gummit. <laughs> he might have had a gummit for what he lived. 930. He he would have had the gummit for 800 some 30 years. I said, look, how how did that work out? He said, now, now the people who question this now, that ain't from God. Yeah. He said, more than, more than two sets of teeth. That's all we get. You get your primary teeth when you first you know, kid, and then all of a sudden you start losing those teeth, and here comes your main teeth that you're going to have to the day you, know, you die, if they last that long, if you take care of them. I'm saying, two sets of teeth. I said, look, could I possibly, if I had gotten into this study sooner and understood it deeper, like my whole book, I talk about the rise and the fall, and I was is developing this. I said, could I have had maybe possibly stirred in me out of the renewed mind and up out of my spirit? Could my spirit have given me more than two sets of teeth? I believe the answer is yes. But, I mean, I don't expect it now. Do I hope? Pray? Yeah, sure. Why not? What have I got to lose? Somebody can laugh at me someday. He used to think he was going to get more than two. You no. Know, has this ever been recorded? I looked it up on the web. Guess what? There are people who have had more than two sets of teeth. And they don't know why. 
Now, I don't know if they were in the biblical things that I'm talking about here. But I'm saying it's potentially possible to have more than two sets of teeth. That's the same way with loss of hair. I'm going bald. Could we possibly have longevity of our hair if we got in this sooner? Not that it matters. I'm not trying to get that. I'm not going to go off and get a hair weave. You know, you could do that. Get a hair weave, but that looked like a painful process to get that done. So you could have a sense of value and worth because you didn't lose your hair. Don't feel like an old man. People see you as old and gray, and you're going bald, and you lost your teeth. you got wrinkles in your face. Well, there's all kind of substance and cream and everything else. They're trying to do that. Botox. You know, getting beyond all this stuff. So the question, oh, great, where is your victim? Well, we know the finale, if you should die, you will be resurrected. Then Christ will rise first. But we who are yet living, could that be applied now? Yet living? The mystery group? Behold, I show you a mystery. And the law will sleep. There's going to be those who will be alive when it comes. Well, they'll be like 30, 40 years old when Jesus comes. How about he doesn't come for another 100 years? That means then I'm going to be the dead in Christ. Because I'm 69, November I'll be 70. So uh, if he doesn't come for another 100 years, I'll be 100. I would be 170 years old. Of course, the cutoff is 121 and 123. And I'll just go away everywhere else and just die. Go to living, go to dying. It doesn't really matter. You're the dead in Christ. You rise. To the promise of what God promised before the foundation of the world, all the things I talk about, save you, spirit, soul, body, the whole total being. He promised. doesn't matter. But wouldn't it be interesting that you could, say if you don't come for the next 50 years, I'd be up over 120-some years old. I'd be close to 123. How about you didn't come for another 60 years? I'd be present for 130. How about 70? Higher and higher. Could he sustain my life? If he has a will and purpose for me to be here. I believe there's an appointment to that. Once to die, and then to be resurrected. People would throw that in my face. So, well, you have to die. Well, you argue, don't argue with me, go argue with Paul. He saw a mystery. But he didn't understand because he didn't partake of it. Had he hoped? Yeah, he expressed it all the time. Hope he could be part of that mystery group. He gives his life. No one took it. He laid his life down. Like Jesus did. And all those after him, no one took the life. They laid it down. I developed that in that book. Oh, they died of natural cause and effect. Or they died by the hand of Rome. Or they were persecuted and died. Or they had heart attacks. I mean, we can come up with all kind of reasoning as to why they die and stuff like that. But many of them said that. No one takes it. I lay it down. He said, Jesus said that. No one takes my life. I lay it down for the sheep. No one takes it. And I will take it up again. He takes it up again to his feet. You observe that on the cross? When he says on the cross, after his mind had been pretty well destroyed his body had been beaten half to death but for the strength of his spirit he would have never made it and the last thing he gives up in that cross when his body dies now I commend my spirit unto you the spirit it was the spirit when he said he takes up his life again that was the spirit quickened by the Holy Spirit to the power of his father and that Father is our Father. And it's Him developing our spirit that renews the soul, that sustains this body that appears to be dying. I got doing the uh, Jews being in the wilderness for 40 years, and, and finally Joshua is going to lead them to the, to the promised land, Caleb. I believe he was about 80 years old. Goes to battle. And as they win the Holy Land, he gets the land that he was promised, which was on the other side of the Jordan. And said his he was still of full strength. His eyes had not abated him, nor his strength. Imagine that. 
You know, in the wilderness, their shoes didn't even wear out. Can you imagine that? We can't imagine that. Well, there's so much more. I want to, I'm this is I'm just rambling here. Now, oh, grave, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The question we ask, okay, he's asking you. So how do you find out? You ask back. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Then he replied, the sting of death is sin. Well, what do you mean by sin? Because you smoke, oh, you smoke, and you're going to die early. You're going to go, go, no, you're going to die because you smoke. This has to do with substance. And then you try to apply body exercise so you don't smoke, you don't drink. You watch your food, you watch your cholesterol, you do all this stuff. Paul said, yeah, that's body exercise. You're probably some. But if you get into this thing of godliness, remember it says, great is the mystery of godliness. I show you a mystery, not all of us sleep. The mystery of iniquity. I want to get in now. I'll try to work on that. Get into some of this thing about the mysteries. The mystery of godliness. The mystery of how people won't sleep, won't die. The mystery of godliness. Iniquity. is sin. Sin is a nature. And that sin nature came from the originator of iniquity. It says in heaven, in heaven, Deucer and iniquity was found in them. So this thing of the iniquity that visits the third and fourth generation through the fallen parents who had this sin nature, it's, like I said, and how can I put it? People who get cut off from God, who start off, Pre-diluting age with full power. This would be 900 years old, 500 years, 600, 700 years old. They lived long periods of time. After the biblical flood, the whole diet changed. Everything changed. The water canopy was gone. A lot of things come into play that didn't have during the biblical flood, before the biblical flood. That now, that longevity of life is going downhill. So evolution hasn't spiraled upwards. Evolution is a downward spiral. And that's why they're saying they're going to try to speed up evolution. I said, you, you people are diehards. <laughs> You're a diehard as to sin and death and dying. You on your you keep following after the world's opinion and ideas. It's called the flesh. Paul said in that same text, I believe Romans chapter 10, be on your way to dying. Be on your way to dying. It's inevitable. You can't stop it. But if you could see where the sting of death came from and how the law was was given to expose this sin by strengthening it, it lay dormant. The law strengthened it to expose it. It wasn't the law. I mean, it was there to, to expose. It was good in that it exposes the sin nature's in you. Like strengthening it, it gets you to see that something greater is a power available. That said, the law said do this, do that, but gave no power. It wasn't terror to give you. You don't get your power from the from the law, the dead letter of the word, as Paul called it. The power came from his resurrection. He said, "I want to know this power." I want to know the power of his resurrection, which conquered the grave, which conquered death, which removed the sting of death, that took away sin, and used and the law to help me see this. Who will deliver me from this embodiment of death? We know the answer. And Paul says it's a mystery of godliness. Why? Whatever you needed to answer all these questions lays dormant within your dormant spirit and by an act of your free will you may not understand this or feel like it. Father, if this be true, I am willing. It's a willingness, not willpower. You don't have no willpower. It will go in another direction. Whatever power has, it takes you downhill. It don't take you uphill. 
by an act of my free will. I surrender at this moment my spirit and activate my spirit, renew my soul. I beg you, brethren, by the four mentioned mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, whole, acceptable unto God, for this is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. you got to give it up. He that seeks to save this mindset will lose this eternal mindset, and you're going to have a limited mind in a second resurrection of those who have rejected what God has offered, who get only one part of it. They get an eternal body. And their limited soul lives in an eternal body that's cut off from God forever and doesn't grow anymore. You ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? Every morning you wake up, it's Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. No matter how you try to get out of it, you're stuck in it. Of course, in that movie, he gets he finds a way out of it. Go in there, watch the whole movie. Find out how he got out of that. Truth. Set him free. And wasn't Groundhog Day. One morning at the end of the movie he wakes up and it's not Groundhog Day. He faced the truth about his limitations. So that's the end of that for now. So God bless you. That's in that matter.